Today's topic is this thing called the Master Theorem. Okay, so what we've done thus far in terms of algorithm analysis, right? We started last week with the card sorting, okay? And how did you guys sort the cards? You essentially sorted them um, in an iterative method or something, but it wasn't a recursive procedure that you used for sorting. Theoretically, one could have done a recursive procedure to sort, um, like at the end of last time we talked about the merge sort process, which is recursive. Uh, basically, you subdivide the pile, you sort of partially sort each pile, and then you do something to recombine the partially sorted piles, okay? Uh, none of you did that when you were doing the sorting, but you theoretically could have. Um, but the, the algorithm analysis that we've done, uh, say before we mentioned merge sort, were for procedures where we could just sort of directly analyze it because they weren't recursive. So this would have been the linear search algorithm where basically you just search through all the cards until you find the two or whatever that you're looking for. Okay, um, and then also the bubble sort method where we saw exactly what that algorithm was. It was not recursive. And we figured out what the running times sort of at worst case were for each of those. We also were able to do the Towers of Hanoi. Now we hadn't really thought about algorithmic complexity at that point when we were doing the Towers of Hanoi. We were just counting the number of steps it took. But that basically meant that it was the algorithmic complexity. Okay, so the master theorem and sort of to, to polish this off today is we want to think about, well, what about if we have a recursive procedure? What then? There are multiple methods for dealing with recursive problems in terms of figuring out their runtime. And this master theorem is one of those methods. So it's not the only way, but it's, um, uh, it is a way. Okay, so for this, let's suppose that P of N is a recursive within things or inputs or whatever. Okay, so that could be we have N cards. It could be we have uh, N disks for our Tower of Hanoi problem. It could be that we've got N pieces of data that we need to do something with, okay? So um, what we're of course interested in is is what happens when N starts to get really, really big. Okay, so the larger n is, obviously the problem gets more complex, but we want to kind of suss out how much more complex based on n. Uh, it could be that it doesn't get any more complex at all. Not often is that the case. It could be that it gets uh, increases in complexity in sort of a polynomial fashion. We saw that with bubble sort. Uh, or it could be exponential like we saw with the Towers of Hanoi. Okay, so that's what we want to suss out here, okay? Now, if P is a recursive procedure, typically, um, the how does a recursive procedure work? Well, sort of the whole point of recursion is to take a problem and to divide it into smaller problems that you do several copies of, okay? So for example, with merge sort, I have, let's say I wanted to sort eight cards. Well, I split that into two chunks of four and I could worry about each of the chunks of four and then combine the results back together, okay? So in all of this, we're going to divide, oops, divide, would help if I could spell, P of N into A sub problems of size n over b each, okay? For the merge sort case, the 
both of those numbers were two. We divide the problem into two pieces, each of which are half as big. Um, and, but it's not necessarily the case that these two numbers are the same. They are for the merge sort, but not in general, okay? Um, okay, so, um, right, so if I've got eight cards, I could say divide the problem into sorting two sets of four cards, and then I could further subdivide that possibly, and, and with merge sort we do, but I'm gonna split the problem into two or more smaller pieces, deal with each piece, okay? But then I also have to recombine. So the recombining of the subproblems, the, the partial results, is not trivial. That requires some effort. Okay. And so what we're going to do is suppose that. So let me just write this, and then I'll explain what this means in a second. Oops. It would help if I could spell. Let's try this again. Okay, every time I split the problem, the amount of work that I have to do depends on two pieces. The two, the, the subproblems, that's some pile of work, and then putting the subproblems back together to answer the full question is another part. Okay, so the running time here, or the complexity, I'll call T of N, meaning how much time does it take, or steps, or whatever, for N inputs. Well, it's going to take some work to do all the recursive stuff, okay, and it's going to take some work for the recombining stuff. And so I want to think of this as I'm splitting the problem into A copies, each of which is size N over B. Uh, for merge sort, A and B are both two, but they don't have to be in general. And then there's the recombining part. Basically, if I've got two partially sorted piles, how do I combine those into a fully sorted pile? Okay, uh, so this is a general uh, expression, and this equation that we have, this entire contraption is called a recurrence relation. Okay, and it basically, it's a recurrence relation, and the word recursion is sort of present there because the formula T of N also sort of depends on itself, okay? Solving these things can be difficult. It can be done. Uh, and if we could solve that recurrence relation, then we would have a formula for T of N, okay? If we could do that, right? And there are techniques for solving these recurrence relations. But let's sort of think about what is our actual goal here? Do I actually care about the formula for T of N? Like exactly what the formula looks like? No, all I care about is sort of what roughly speaking it looks like. Okay, so the difference there, what I mean is, let's say I solve some recurrence relation and I get that T of N is N cubed plus 5N squared minus 3N plus 7. I'm just making something up. Do I really care about that? No, what I care about is it's basically N cubed, right? So that for large values of N, how does it grow? The other terms are sort of lost. They're, they're not important. It's the in cube part that I care about, okay? So while I could potentially solve the recurrence relation, I don't really care about its solution. I just want to know sort of roughly what form it is, and that's what we can get away with here, okay? So I'm not going to actually solve the recurrence relation, even though theoretically we could. Okay, so... Um, Let me make a definition here. I'm going to define this number C to be the log base B of A.
And in the case of the merge sort, what were A and B? So for the merge sort algorithm, what was A, what was B? How many subproblems do we divide into? Two, and each of which is half the size, okay? So A and B are both two in this case. Okay, and I'm choosing to define C as the log base B of A. So in this case, it's the log base two of two. Well, what is the log base two of two? Pray tell. One. Okay. Um, now, how many of you guys are now in your worst nightmare because logarithms got involved? Okay. So, you don't like logs? No? Okay. Um, they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Actually, they predate sliced bread, but whatever, right? So, so let's, let me kind of make a digression for a moment. When did you guys first encounter logarithms in school? Pre-calc or maybe algebra two, depending on how your school set up its curriculum. Okay. Um, why did you first encounter logarithms? Like what, what did you need them for? to get rid of exponentials, right? Basically you learned them as, hey, we have exponential functions and hey, we need to solve equations where variables are stuck up in the exponents, like for example, compound interest kind of equations or something. And so the logarithm undoes that. It's the inverse of the exponential function. Great, but that is 100% wrong from a historical perspective. I mean, it's true that they are inverses of each other and that's a use of them. But that's not how we discovered them in the first place. Okay, so let me go on a historical tangent for a moment. Who invented slash discovered logarithms? Anybody have any idea? John Napier, anybody ever heard that name before? No? Nope. All right, Scottish mathematician, 16th century. Why he figured these out was for the following. John Napier was writing a book on trigonometry. And not just any trigonometry, you guys have all studied trigonometry, yes? Yeah, you would have had to in high school at some point in pre-calc or geometry or whatever. He wasn't doing just regular trigonometry. He was doing spherical trigonometry, which means what happens if I have a triangle that's on the surface of a sphere? Well, one of the things that's interesting about such triangles is that their sides are kind of bendy, right? So a spherical triangle might look something, well, this is the worst picture ever, but um, the spherical triangle, its sides are actually arcs of circles and I could have a right angled one. And maybe I'll label the sides A, B, and C. Okay, say, uh, if this were a planar triangle, what relationship do you know between A, B, and C? Yeah, Pythagoras' theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, on the sphere, it turns out to be this. This is the spherical Pythagorean, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, okay? Now, this begs the question, why was he trying to do trigonometry on spheres in the first place? What possible application could that have? Any ideas? Hmm? No, this is a very practical question. You've got a ship and you want to sail from London to Boston. How do you do it? How do you know which way to point the ship? Well, okay, the sun's gonna help a little bit, but there's a minor problem with the sun. You, it moves and you can't see it for half the day. But what can you see for the other half of the day? The stars. And guess what? Those move in very predictable patterns with the exception of the planets. They spin, right? So 
navigating by the stars means you're doing trigonometry on the sphere. That's suddenly a very practical problem because it's not as if Napier or whoever was sailing around back then could bust out their iPhones or their GPSs. Those didn't exist yet, right? So how do you navigate by the stars? Well, you have to be really good at math, namely spherical trig. Okay, so this is the Pythagorean theorem. Now, let's say that I give you values for A and B, like I measure them. You plug them into these cosines, okay, that's already a pain in the ass, but you would have had a table that, of those that had been pre-computed. If you need to be really precise, because if you're not precise, you, oh, I don't know, crash into a rock or land up in uh, Bermuda when you thought you were going to Boston, right, because you effed up some arithmetic. Uh, so if you want to be super precise, well, what kind of values are cosine? What's cosine always in between? Negative one to one, okay? So your numbers, let's say, are they're going to be zero point something or other, right? And possibly negative. Uh, and let's say that you want to be really precise, so you have 10 digits after the decimal point. Seem reasonable? Okay, let's say you've got two of those numbers. What do you have to do if you know cos A and cos B to 10 decimal places? You'd have to multiply them. Do you want to multiply two 10 digit numbers? That would really suck right? That would be a crap ton of work. So what do you do instead? You use a logarithm because the logarithm turns a product into a sum. And I don't know about you guys, but adding is a shitload easier than multiplying. Yes? Ah, so logarithms. In fact, you could argue that their fundamental property is that they do this. They turn some, or excuse me, products into sums, and equivalently, what do they do to quotients? So the log of a fraction becomes the difference of the log, right? So logarithm turns multiplication into addition and division into subtraction. And subtraction and addition are both much easier than multiplication and division. Yes? Okay. This will, um, this will come back to be useful later. And you guys see what I did there with this historical tangent? <sighs> okay. Let's get back to it. Okay. So let me write the following again. We had our recurrence relation, which was of this form. Oops. Okay, so we've got two pieces of work, the recursive part and the recombining part. Okay, so there are three cases that emerge that we need to consider. The first one is that f of n is O of n to the d with d less than c. Okay, and the way to think about this is the recursive part is the meat of the problem and the recombining part is relatively easy compared to the recursion. Uh, the Towers of Hanoi will actually fit into this category and we'll see that in a little bit, okay? Um, okay, good. Uh, if that's the case, then the t of n's running time is o big o of n to the c okay case two this one's a little complicated so just bear with me for a second OK, 
okay? Um, so if f of n is of that form, then the running time is of this sort of related form where the exponent of the logarithm term gets kicked up by one, okay? I'll write some examples in a minute with specific numbers that'll hopefully make this a little bit more clear. So bear with me. Okay, and then the third case is that f of n is big O of n to the d for d greater than c. And so in that case, tn is big O of f of n. Um, and this is sort of the recombining dominates. Okay, so sort of the rough way to think about this is uh, the recursive part could be the really hard part, the recombining part could be the hard part, or they could be kind of on similar levels to each other, um, and that's sort of what case two is, okay? Um, okay, so this fundamentally is the master theorem, okay? Is if, F, if we have a recurrence relation of that form, and we know something about the f of n term, then we can conclude something about what t of n looks like. Okay, and like I said, we'll do a couple of examples here with specific numbers, okay? Okay, now, while you guys are scribbling that down, let me just kind of um, you know, talk about kind of the structure of what we're doing bro more broadly beyond this, right? So last week and today, we've been really hammering the algorithm analysis part of computer science, okay? Algorithms are things that you run on computers, right? And so you need to care as to how long it's gonna to take to run them because your computer can't do infinitely much work, right? And if you've got a problem that, like you're trying to crack a password that's 100 letters long, well, that's gonna take you centuries worth of work, right? So it's not practical to do it with a computer. Um, okay, but more structurally, what I'm trying to do with most of this class is basically give you guys like a chef's tasting menu with lots of different, so like, has anybody ever gone to a, a fancy dinner at a restaurant where it's a tasting menu where you have like 12 courses, but each one is like appetizer size? Uh, and you get to try all kinds of different preparations or, or ingredients or whatnot, right? So the benefit of that is you get to taste a wide variety of different things, but you're not getting a full meal out of any one individual course, right? We could do that, and that's essentially what the purpose of this class is, is I want to give you guys the tasting menu as to what computer science is all about. Programming is certainly part of it, but it's not all of it. Because does this look like programming to you guys? No. And what its relationship to programming is is not entirely clear. But guess what you do in CS211 and CS243 especially? Crap tons of this. Okay. So, I mean, for how many of you is this statement true? You liked math and you were good at it. And then one day the alphabet joined math class. And that was the worst day ever. Yeah? Was that the worst day ever, Curtis? For me, it was the best day ever. Because no longer was math about tedious computation, but about actual thought and non-tedium. And I was like, this is wonderful. Now, for most people, you know, my poor sister included, she's in a college algebra class this semester, basically, and hates it. Um, and I'm on basically speed dial for her to help her with math class. Um, anyway, so what we're doing here is like really what the meat of CS243 would be about, okay? And next time we'll start talking about something that's going to come across completely different, more abstract about, well, what does it even mean to have a computer in the first place? What limits are there on computation? Limits in terms of time? Okay, that's certainly a limit, right? But if I've got a fancy $1,000 computer that can solve the problem in 100 years, could I maybe put together a million-dollar computer that could solve the problem in 10 years? Maybe. Are the problems that a computer of any power, no matter how 
good you make it and how much money you throw at it still can't solve? Turns out, yes, and that's really interesting, okay? And so we'll spend about a week and a half talking about theory of computation, okay? uh, which is, guess what, CS244, right? Okay, so uh, let's look at examples, two specific examples of the master theorem, okay? One with merge sort, and then we'll do the uh, uh, binary search. Okay, so, okay so far? All right, so merge sort. The recurrence relation for more merge sort is this, okay? Um, now let's think about why it's of that form. If I split the problem into two subproblems and the cards are sorted within those subproblems, then how much work, or maybe equivalently, how many cards do I have to look at to put the two problems back together? Well, I have to look at all the cards. If there are n cards, then I have to look at n of them, right? So the recombining part is in, just n. The recursive part is I divide each problem or I divide my stack of cards into two stacks that are each half the size. Okay, seems like a reasonable approach, right? So let's say I have eight cards. I divide them into two stacks of four, deal with each stack of four individually, and then put somehow have to put these stacks of four back together. Okay, so that's the recurrence relation. All right, what is C in this case? In this case, A and B are both two, and so the log base two of two is one. And so that means that our number C and our number D are actually the same value, okay? So D here is the, the thing that uh, F of N is O of N to the something, and the something in this case is one, which just so happens to be C, okay? So which case of the master theorem applies. Does case one apply? No, why not? Because that would require for one to be less than one, right? In case one, D must be less than C. Here we have D equals C. So case one's out. Case three is also out for the same reason. Okay, so what case maybe applies to, okay? However, what the heck is with this logarithm, okay? Case two requires that F of N be of this form, N to the something, log N to the something else. Do I see a log N in my F of N formula? No, but I'm gonna be sneaky. I see it. There is a logarithm there. It just has an exponent of zero. Okay, because what's anything to the zero? One. Okay, so is my f of n of the appropriate form to apply case two? And let me scroll up a little bit. All right, is my f of n n to the c times the log of n to some power uh, here? Yes? Okay. What is K in this case? Zero, because do I actually have a logarithm in my F of N term? No. Okay. So according to the master theorem, what should our T of N be? T of N is big O of N to the first times the log of N to the first. in log n, okay? So, bam, there it is. That's the runtime, well, essentially worst case, for merge sort. 
Okay, so you see how we kind of had to be a little clever here with in terms of, well, it didn't look like there was a logarithm, but actually there was. It was just sort of hidden. Yeah, I'm going to play that trick one more time today. Okay, now, in log in, we looked at this last time when we were talking about the merge sort algorithm and we pulled it up on Wikipedia, right? And for all of these algorithms, you pull them up on Wikipedia or any other reference for that matter, right? And it's going to say what their complexities are. Okay, now, is in log in bigger or better or worse than, say, in squared? What did we say there? It's better than n squared, okay? What was the sorting algorithm that was O of n squared? Worst case. Well, the bubble sort method, right? Okay, so what have we essentially discovered, or maybe rediscovered? What's better, merge sort or bubble sort? Merge sort in terms of the complexity for large values of n, okay? And so we've basically rediscovered something that we thought we knew on Friday. All right, let's do one more example, which is binary search. Okay, so the way binary search works, let's suppose that I've got a pile of cards and they are already sorted, but there's not every consecutive card is present. So, for example, I could have something like I could have something like this, okay? A 2, a 5, a 7, and a 13. So, they are sorted from the get-go, but not all cards are necessarily present, okay? All right, so if I ask you to find the 5, what would be the uh, linear search would be to do what? Look at the first one. Is it the five? No. Look at the second one. Is it the five? Uh, in this case, yes. Okay. But at worst, what's going to happen for linear search? It's going to be the very last one, and it means that you have to go through every single card. Okay. Which means its running time would be at worst O of N because you have to go through every single card. Okay, binary search does the following. The fact that they're sorted in advance, okay, means that we can get away with something, okay, because I could divide this into two pieces. So let me chop my pile and say, all right, my card is either in the first piece or the second piece, right? And let's say I'm looking for the, um, the seven. Okay, well, is it in the first piece? No, okay. Um, and so it's in the second piece. Well, I could subdivide the second piece into two pieces. And so do I ever actually have to look at the 13 in this case? No, okay. So I divide it basically into halves, okay. And let's say that I look at the very last card that's in the first chunk. So let's say I'm looking for the seven. Chop it in half. Look at the last card. That's a five. What do I immediately know that if this is a five, is the seven in this left chunk? No, because they're already sorted. And so I can only do look at a single card from the left-hand pile and know that I don't have to look at any of the other cards in that pile. Okay. Similarly, let's say I was looking for the three or the two because the three's not actually there. Well, let's say I split it in half and I look at the five. Well, I know that two is less than five, right? So if two is in this list, it's gonna be in the first half because I knew that they were already sorted, right? So I can eliminate sort of half of the cards at each stage almost for free. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so what that means for the recurrence relation of it is it's this okay 
here I divide the problem into half as big, but it's only one thing that's half as big, right? Because the card's only going to be in either the left or the right-hand pile. I don't have to fully examine both piles, okay? So this is an interesting case where we subdivide the problem not into two copies that are half the size, but we can actually only look at one copy of half the size, okay? The other thing that's indifferent here is the recombining part. The recombining, well, there's basically no recombining to do. Once you find the card, you're done, right? There's no putting all things back together. You found the card, you're finished. So what that means is that the recombining part is constant time, right? It doesn't actually take any work to recombine the results, okay? Okay, so looking at this, what is our value of C? Well, it's log base B of A, which would be log base 2 of 1. What's the log base 2 of 1? Right. The log of anything, any base of 1 is 0. Okay, and how do we know that? Well, what's anything to the 0? 1. Okay. And F of N, I can actually rewrite as being N to the 0. Right? It looks like the number 1, but is it into the 0, 1? Yeah? So now I've written it in a form that will allow me to apply the master theorem. Okay, Which case are we in? Our exponent, C, is the, the value of C is the same as the exponent on top of the N for um, uh, the f of n term. So case one and three are out the window, okay? And I can play the exact same trick that I did last time to say it's O of n to the zero log n to the zero. So case two, and I get it's O log N. That's better than O of N, which is what the linear search would have been in this case. Okay, so this was another instance of case two of the master theorem. Okay, we just had to kind of rewrite things in such a way that we could directly apply the, the theorem. Okay, good? Cranial explosions, yeah, we'll take a little bit of time for this to sort of sink in. It's all right. Okay, so the very last thing I want to do is to consider the Towers of Hanoi case. Okay, so let's remind ourselves, we actually know what the complexity of the Towers of Hanoi were. If there were n disks, how many steps did it or moves did it take? It was 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so if we had 5 disks, it took 31 moves. 2 to the 5th is 32. Subtract 1, it's uh, 31. Okay. Um, the recursive way of thinking about it, and this is actually what you guys noticed, was how many moves did it take to do it for four disks? Fifteen. So how many should it take for five? Twice fifteen plus one. Now why that? Well, if I have five disks, how do I solve the problem? Move four out of the way, move the bottom one, move the four back. Right? So it's two instances of the previous problem plus one operation to move the biggest disk, and that's it, right? Okay, so what that tells us is, and I'm going to have to go over to the new sheet here, for the Towers of Hanoi, the recurrence relation is this. Um, To solve the problem, we solve two copies that have one fewer disk, 
and then the recombining part is moving that bottom disk. Okay, so the recombining part is really easy here. The recombining step is just one, one single operation, moving that big disk. The meat of the work is in the recursive case. Okay, and that made sense, right? When you guys were doing the, the actual towers, right, you saw that. Okay, can I apply the master theorem to this directly? And I'm going to say no, because what was the assumption about this term t uh, n minus 1? Is that of the form n divided by a number? No, which is what the master theorem required. So it looks like I can't apply the master theorem. But I'm going to be devious. Okay. All right, how many of you guys are in calculus, right? Or how many of you guys have seen U substitutions in calculus, okay? So what is the whole point of U substitution in calculus? You make a change of variables and a hard problem becomes easy, right? So I'm gonna make a change of variables and by being sneaky about exactly which change of variables I make, I can turn a problem where I can't use the master theorem into one where I can. Okay, so devious, 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 devious. Let me suppose that n is actually log base 2 of m. Okay, now for large values of n, this is okay uh, to do. Okay, so I'm making a change of variables here, kind of like you do in calculus. Okay, why this is a brilliant move will become clear in a moment. Well, okay, so I'm just going to substitute everywhere I see an N, I'm going to replace it with this logarithm. Actually, let me put the equal there. Okay. We're going to play a trick that we often do in math classes. Namely, I'm going to rewrite the number one and put it in fancy clothing. Right? And the fancy clothing that I choose to put it in is this. Isn't the log base 2 of 2 equal to 1? We've used that once before today. Yes? Hmm. Well, now notice what I have here. I have a difference of two logarithms, do I not? Ah. And now, the difference of the logs is the log of the, the quotient, right? So I used the logarithm trick that seemed like I was waxing poetic, but now actually is useful. Okay, so let me do the following then. Instead of log base 2 of m, let me just, or sorry, of, um, uh, hold on. Uh, yes, okay. Instead of log base 2 of m, let me write s of m. So that means that I have the following recurrence relation. Okay, so, uh, because what I've done, right, is I've changed basically T's into S's. But in doing so, what do I notice about this recurrence relation? Let 
master theorem applies. Because what do I have? I have that S is two copies of half the size plus some recombining thing. Is this of the form that the master theorem allows me to deal with? Yes. Okay, so which case of the master theorem are we in? Well, what is the value of C in this case? A and B are both two, so what's the log base two of two? One, and D is zero because Our f of n term, there is no exponent. It's zero. Okay? So here we have d equals zero and c equals one. Which case of the theorem does that put us in? It puts us in case one. Okay? All right, so hence, case one applies. And so S of M is O of uh, M. And we're not quite finished because what was M? Or sorry, what was the relationship between N and M? Well, if n is the log base 2 of m, what is m? How do I solve this for m? It's 2 to the n, right? Okay. Okay, that's the, right, solving the equation n equals log 2 of m means that m is really 2 to the n, right, sort of undoing the logarithm. And that means that t of n, the running time for the towers of Hanoi, is big O of 2 to the n. Well, guess what? Did we already know that? We did. Right, we did it because we actually solved the puzzle. But now we've reconfirmed it with the master theorem. Okay, what would have really, really sucked here is if we got a different answer than what we did before, right? So the reason I wanted to do this one is to say, okay, we had a problem that we've already solved, and if we massage things a little bit by doing some clever algebra, we can apply the master theorem, which gives us the exact answer that we already knew. Well, that's a good thing, right? So it just confirms that the answer that you guys sort of discovered experimentally is genuinely correct. Right, so now we have two reasons to know that the uh, Towers of Hanoi is exponential. Yeah, wasn't this fun? A lot of math. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I will see you guys on Wednesday.